King James Version reads thus. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market or the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethsaida, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folks or sick folks of blind, halt, withered. So it's given us a description of these, uh, their infirmities, their physical infirmities. Um, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse four, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, whosoever or whoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had had. So they were healed. Verse five, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity for 30 and eight years or 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie or lying and knew that he had been now a long, had, he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, what will thou be made whole? So notice here in this scripture, it's revealing to us Jesus's omniscience or all knowing. So for 38 years, Jesus knew, Jesus knew his state. Jesus knew his condition. He knows your condition. He knows your state. Again, going back to the scripture I shared with you earlier, Hebrews chapter 13, the three scriptures I shared, he's a very present help. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's omniscient. He already knows our situation. So be aware. He knows the situation. He knows your situation, where you are, spiritually where you are, mentally where you are, physically. He knows every pain, every ailment, every infirmity that you and I have. And he is moved with compassion. All right. So then Jesus asked a question of this man in verse six. Will you be made whole? Notice he uses the same word, the word whole in the King James as the same one in the verse four. Anyone who stepped into the water, the first one who stepped into the water was made whole or made complete. So now Jesus asked the question in verse six of this one man who had been in this particular situation 38 years, will you be made whole? In verse seven, the impotent man answered him, sir, notice the respect. Remember, we see the same type of respect with the Samaritan woman using the same word, sir, in John chapter four. Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So evidently his um, impotency, his, his ailment, his infirmity, if you please, um, had something to do with the walking. Because as he proceeded towards the pool during the, the troubling, the word King James used troubling or the stirring of the water, as he was approaching the water, someone else would step in before him, therefore get that blessing get that spiritual benefit so he would miss out. So that's what he said in verse seven. But notice, he said, sir, notice the respect. He said, I have no man to put me in the water. But while I am coming, another step down before me. And Jesus, verse eight, Jesus said unto him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Verse nine. And immediately the man was made whole or man was made complete. And he took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So it's, it's segue is moving us into another area which we may deal with the Sabbath another day. So let's look at these scriptures. Let's look at this passage of scriptures in John chapter five, verse one through nine. So again, I already mentioned to you, 
the Bible says here that after this, so after John chapter four, he was in Samaria, they made their way to Jerusalem. And notice what the Bible, let me give you a little bit of geographical uh, ge ge geo lesson, if you please. He said, if there was a feast of, Jer of the Jews and Jesus went up, a lot of times in the King James, so I'm just gonna give you a kind of a tidbit on studying, especially from the King James. King James uses words, and um, of course it was taken from the 1600s, early, late 1500s, early 1600s, 1611 when it was completed. So it's in the old King James writing. So they would use words such as this, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. What they're referring to is the geography. So from where Jesus left in Samaria, the sea level is not so much north, south, east, or west, because we know Jerusalem was south, as we look at it on the map, it was south in nature from the city of Sychar, Samaria. So what this is referring to, so again, a tidbit just for studying, when you read something like this, especially in King James, Jesus went up, it's referring to the Mediterranean Sea. And if you look at a map and you have one of those sea level maps, Jerusalem was at a very high level. So this gives us insight on why Jerusalem was built, where it was built, it was easier to defend. So again, that's just to say he went up. Not only that, so it also lets us know, it gives us some insight that as they travel by foot, they were um, exposed to fatigue and, and, and becoming tired and, and requiring more liquids to sustain that physical strength. So all these things are inclusive when we're reading and studying the Bible, when we come across things such as Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And as we look at the map and say, no, it's below, it's south of where he left from, but it's referring to elevation, that change of elevation, which impacts the body impacts the physical body. So with that being said, now it's gonna talk about all these physical healings. So verse two, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep gate or market or sheep gate where the sheep would come in, they would bring them into the market through a particular gate. There was a pool which is, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethsaida or Bethsaida, Bethsaida having five porches. And now, so it, it gives us to the location. So if you look at a map of Jerusalem, the old, old town Jerusalem, as they call it, um, you'll know where the sheep came into the gate. You'll give you a picture of where the five, uh, where this pool uh, was and the five porches. So it gives us a picture in our mind. And then it goes on and says, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folks. So these five porches, right? We got all these sick people. So it's, it's, the Bible gives us a picture. So it helps us understand what this man said. So when I make my way to the pool, when the angels come down and stir the water, you got all these people occupying these five porches. I don't have a chance. I, I don't have a chance in the world to get to that water to be made whole, to be made complete, to be healed because I'm contending with all these people, all these impotent folks that's occupying these five porches, all right? So in verse three, in these lay a great multitude, again, in studying the Bible, pull out those words. Don't be so quick just to read over them because it is it's giving a picture. Lay a great multitude of sick folks or impotent folks and then they, some were blind, some were halt, some were withered. So again, giving us a description of the various disabilities as we call them. Um, shortcomings in the physical body, blind, halt, withered, and they were all there waiting for the moving of the water. So in this one scripture, it gives us the description of the people the great multitude of people that's occupying these five porches. It gives us a description on some of their physical infirmities. And then it also shows us their faith. It shows us their faith. 
the Bible used here in, in the King James, waiting for the moving of the water. So they had faith that at a certain time, an angel was coming down. It was going to trouble or stir the water. And if they could beat everyone else there into that pool of water, they had faith, they had belief, they had trust, they had confidence to the point they were willing to wait around all, all, all these, they were willing to wait around the sheep market. You say, well, why is that a big deal? Well, not everyone is willing to wait around where a bunch of animals reside. It would be like at a petting zoo. Who wants to hang out at a petting zoo day in and day out? But as a result of their faith, they were willing to wait in this area for the angel to come down and trouble the water. So what we have here, what we begin to see in these scriptures as we read them, as we dissect them, what is God communicating to us in this chapter, in this passage of scripture? Yes, Jesus went down to Jerusalem or elevation. He went up to Jerusalem, right? Um, which is taxing on the body. And he went to this, this uh, Bethsaida, this pool where there was a bunch of physically, a great multitude of physically impaired people who had faith that God would heal them, that there would be a divine healing if they waited. So what does that communicate to us? What does that speak to us? Regardless of your physical disability as it is labeled, have faith in God trust in God, believe in God. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't given up on you. So verse four, the Bible says this, for an angel went down, so it, it goes on and it tells us what they were waiting for. So it says, waiting for the moving of the water. So for a new Christian, or even a person who's been living for God, said, why would they wait around a pool for the moving of the water? So the Bible doesn't leave us hanging. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 that God is not the author of confusion. So he goes on and he explains to us. And this is something that we learn to do as Christians, as human beings, as we conversate one with another, as, especially in Christianity. Let me just stick with Christianity. If God is leading us to talk to someone, an opportunity, we have the opportunity to talk to a family member, opportunity to talk to a loved one, opportunity to talk to someone who's open to hear what we have to say. We don't want to leave them with um, half sentences or short sentences. Sometimes as the Holy Spirit leads us, and that's the key, you want to give them the description of what you're talking. You don't want them to try to process and come to their own conclusions. You want to give them as many details as possible. Make no assumptions. Anyone knows what we know or what you know in the word of God. So give as many descriptions as simple as possible, but yet having an impact on the hearer. So, so verse four, that's what Jesus, that's what the Bible does here. For an angel went down at, the, at a certain season, at a certain time into the pool and troubled or stirred the water. And then it tells us, so it, it tells us why they were waiting. They knew there was be an angel would come down at a certain time and would stir the water. And then it goes on to tell us in the scripture, whoever, whoever then First, so notice it gives us a priority and like a, a order. Whoever, so no prejudice, no limitations. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, because the Bible says whoever, right? And we know that to be true from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, so the entire human race. So now we have this scripture, this part of this scripture in John 5, 4. It says whoever who had a physical uh, impairment. Whoever first, after the stirring of the water, the troubling of the water, whoever was the first one to step in was made whole or made complete of whatsoever disease he had. So what I'm talking about here, what my thought pattern here is, 
there's no limitation, right? There's no limitation on who God can heal. There's no limitation on what God can heal. So whoever was the first one who stepped into the water after it was stirred by the angel was made whole, made complete, healed of whatever disease they had. So there's no limitations. There was no limit. If you can make it to this pool, if you were the first one into the pool, I'm bringing that out because here in verse five, it tells us there was a certain man of 38 years old, or he had an infirmity 38 years. He could have been 38 years old. We know he was at least 38 years old. Um, he could have been older. He had this infirmity for 30 eight years. So maybe for 38 years with this infirmity, he was laying there. He was laying there waiting. And each time, I don't know the frequency of the angel coming to visit that pool, but whatever the frequency was of the angel coming to visit that pool, can you imagine his anticipation level? Okay, maybe this is my day. Maybe this is my time. Maybe if I get closer and the angel is coming down, well, everyone has that thought because everyone wants to be made whole. Everyone wants to be healed. So what I'm bringing out here is that in the anticipation of being healed, in dealing with this physical impairment, infirmity, disability, however we label it, however you want to label it, sometimes it can become frustrating. It can become frustrating and it can work on you emotionally, right? I've prayed, I've prayed, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm praying, I'm waiting. And I'm still in the same state. It's been year after year, as with this man, 38 years. So he positioned himself just like we we position ourselves spiritually. We read our Bible. We, we're faithful to God as far as, as much as we know to be faithful to God. We're positioning ourselves to receive the blessings of God, but they're not happening like this man here in John chapter five, verse five. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. So now like us, like us today, some of us are like this man. As a result, you get frustrated, you get tired, you become weary, hope starts slipping. But the next verse, let's go on to the next verse as we look at the Bible and study the Bible. Jesus saw him lie there and the Bible says he knew how long he had been there. He knew how long he had been dealing with this particular infirmity. Jesus, again, I'm gonna reiterate what I've already said to you. Jesus knows what you're dealing with. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's aware. He loves every one of us. He cares about every one of us. Oftentimes, we can't see the bigger picture of what God is doing in us and through us. That's where we just continue. And I'm saying just, and I use only, and I, I don't say those words to be uh, make it smaller or what have you but i say that because when we have nothing else to hold on to we hold on to the word of god to the promises of god and we ask god to allow us to see the bigger bigger picture allow us to see the big picture that he wants us to see all right so jesus asked this man after knowing now look at look, look at this in the bible here in verse six, the Bible tells us Jesus knew this man's case. He knew what he had been through. He knew what he was going through. He knew the struggles he was facing. He knew the frustration that when it was time, when the water was being stirred, the angel had troubled the water, stirred the water. He knew that others would beat him to the water and he would miss the blessing, if you please. Jesus asked the question, Will you be made whole? Now, 
we can look at that and say, why didn't Jesus just heal him? Why didn't Jesus just heal this man? Why did Jesus ask him the question, will you be made whole? It could be viewed as a challenge of one's faith. But as we read throughout the Bible, we read, God already knows, but God asks us questions from time to time. He already knows what he can do. The Bible tells us, Jesus said in the Bible, he said, with man, things may be impossible, with, but with God, all things are possible. So he presents the question, will you be made whole? Do you believe it? In the midst of your frustration, in the midst of your disappointments, in the, in the midst of that discouraging and, and despondency, and those dark, gloomy days, do you believe you can be made whole? God communicates to us sometimes through questions, asking us, do you believe that can happen for you? Do you believe you can get that job? Do you believe you, um, you can get that house? Do you believe this can come to pass for you? Because we know the Bible tells us that in Psalm, what is it, 50, Psalm 50, verse 10, our God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, right? It's just giving us a glimpse into he's unlimited. He can do all these things. He tells us in, he tells us in Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he ends that scripture by saying, and I will add all these things unto you. So the desires of your heart, I like using these scriptures uh, interchangeably or together, I should say, not interchangeably. Uh, Philippians 4.19, we say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. So he'll supply. So by default, he's going to supply our needs. And then I believe it's Psalm 37. Yeah, in Psalm 37, maybe verse four, verse 25, but I believe it's in Psalm 37. He said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. So what we have there is he'll meet our needs. And then he says, I'll give you the desires of your hearts or your wants. So here, Jesus asked the question and he asked us the question, will you be made whole? Will you allow me to bless you? Will you allow me to use you for my glory, for the glory of God, and for the salvation of souls? So notice, let's move on here. Verse 7, the impotent man answered. So it still have that, that, that precursor in front of him. The impotent man, letting us know, letting the reader know that he's talking to this man in his state, in that current state. The impotent man, the sick man the lame man, if you please, answered and said, sir, so he has the respect, I have no man when the water is stirred, when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. So what we see here in this scripture, and I'm not dispelling this, but what is revealed to us that in this man's disability, in this man, in, in his infirmity, he's depending on someone else for a blessing to put him in the position for a blessing from God. And I understand it. He has this infirmity, can't walk, can't get to the troubling of uh, the pool of water at uh, being the first one at, at the time. He can't get there in that time. So he there is a dependency on someone else. And he says, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is troubled. So as a result, I miss out on a divine blessing from God. I miss out on being, made, on being made whole. I am frustrated with my condition. I am frustrated with my situation. I am frustrated with the circumstance. There's five porches of, of impotent folks and I'm competing against them to be healed. So this is the scene, this is the scenario. This is all the things that he's contending with in his mind, his thoughts, just like you and I. All the things in life that we're dealing with, that I'm gonna call it five porches. 
and all these people pulling, this person's pulling, that person's pulling, this person's pulling, they're putting their problems on you. This one's putting their problems on you. And, and you have your own problems. Everybody is trying to make it to the pool to get healed. <laughs> so that's the scene, that's the situation, that's, that's life, that's where we all live. So he tells Jesus this, I'm depending on someone else to help me. And we do, we depend on each other. We, we should depend on one another in God, in God, in God as, we, as God leads us, as God directs us. We shouldn't wholly or solely depend on someone else. Well, I need a blessing. So could you loan? I need a blessing of $5,000. So could someone on this Bible study be a blessing, be a blessing from God and loan me $5? Am I really depending on God or I'm asking one of you on this call? <laughs> so versus me saying, God, I need $5,000. Somehow, some way, lead, some, lead me or lead someone to me, however you choose to do it. I'm making a direct ask to you all. Well, this is my situation and I have no one to give me $5,000. And, uh, $5, and if you did, I know it'd be a blessing from God. Hmm. So this was this man's situation. And then Jesus, after asking him a question in verse six, Jesus listened to his explanation. So in dealing with relationships, if we ask people a question, are you born again? Let's give them the space and time to answer the question. So let's not rush to the answer as many of us preachers do. I've done many times, I already have an answer formulated before they even uh, finish talking. I'm ready to give them my answer because I have my agenda, right? But we learn that we are to listen, listen to them, even if we don't agree with them, even though if we may think it's an excuse, hear them out. And this is a part of relationships and this is a part of conversation, right? Conversation, which develops relationship. Hearing one another out, hearing one another out because they may, that other person that you're communicating with or persons may communicate something to you and I that we didn't think about as far as their situation. All right, so Jesus waited for him to explain to him why he couldn't be made whole. Um, I have no man, I'm depending on someone else to put me in the water when it's stirred at that particular time. And while I'm trying to make my own way when no one else is there and I'm trying to do it on my own and my own strength with this disability, someone else steps in. One of the other potential recipients from who's occupying those five porches they beat me to the beat me to the pool because they have the same mindset I have. Let's get there before him. Verse eight, Jesus said unto him, rise up, take up your bed and walk. So this scripture shows us no limitations. God is, God is not in a box. God is not in our box. What we physically see, what we say, I need to do this to get that. I need to do this for God in order for God to do that for me. No, I need to, if I do this, then God's gonna heal me. And it's almost like mankind putting God in a, let me see how I can say it. Uh, there's conditions, right? There's conditions. I need to get to the pool at a certain time, but I need someone to help me. Those are the conditions. The time is a part of the condition factor. Someone helping me is a part of the condition factor. And if I have those in alignment, then it will equate to me being the first one in the pool and it will equate to me being made whole. Jesus dispelled all that in verse eight. Jesus said his words. So what is God communicating to us? That the word of God is powerful. The word of God is not subjected to a pool. The word of God is not subjected to a paycheck. The word of God is not subjected to anything that we can do with our hands, with our feet. The word of God is not subjected to our thought pattern. Jesus said, rise up, take up your bed 
and walk. Simple words. He didn't lay his hands on them. He didn't, uh, there was no audible prayer for him. He could have prayed in his heart and we pray for people in our hearts. You don't have to wait and say, well, come here. Let me lay my hands on your head and in the name of Jesus. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying I've done it and probably will continue to do it as the Holy Spirit leads me to do it. But that's not conditional for God to heal. As we read in the Bible and study in the Bible, Jesus said, rise up, take up your bed and walk. Now, if Jesus came into your house where you are right now, whatever your, whatever, if you have a physical disability or a physical challenge, whatever it might be, and Jesus stood right before you right now, this moment, get up, take up your bed and walk. How would you respond? You've been dealing with this ailment for 38 years. Jesus appears, he's right here and say, hey, Doug, get up and walk. Jesus, you don't understand. I've been dealing with this for 38 years. I've been missing out on that pool because no one, you know, our reasoning kicks in. And sometimes I've said this to myself, I've shared it with others. Uh, sometimes our reasoning hinders us from being blessed by God because we reason it, well, I've been waiting on the water. Someone beats me in. I believe in the angel coming down, stirring up the water. And now you're standing right here, Jesus, and you just tell me to just take up my bed and get up and walk after 38 years. I haven't done it for 38 years. I know the results of that pool because I've been witnessing that with my eyes. But now, with our spiritual ears, can will we believe what the word of God says, what God is communicating to us? So in verse nine, in verse nine, it says this, and immediately, immediately, the man was made whole completely and took up his bed and walked. Immediately. So I wanna end uh, my lecture. <laughs> by saying this, his faith transferred. His, his faith transferred from the waiting on the pool, his, his faith, when I say faith, his belief, his trust, his confidence, transferred from being the first one to get in the pool in order to be made whole, it transferred to believing what God said the simple words of God. Physically, he would have gone through this whole process. Someone would have picked him up. Someone would have, uh, just for a lack of, uh, of words, dragged him to the pool, put him in the pool. Then he would have that continual faith to be made whole as, as the promises was made when the angels came down. But that faith transferred to the word of God. The simple words, rise up rise, take up your bed, and walk. Just that easy? That easy? That simple, Jesus? He's the word. Remember, going back, what is God communicating to us? John chapter 1. His, his eternal presence, right? His eternal existence. What is God create, uh, uh, communicating to us? Remember, John 1 that he is the creator of all things. He created this man. He created this body and called it man. He spoke the worlds into existence. He is the creator and he made them for his will, for his purpose, Colossians 1. So yes, he can speak to us. He can speak to this body that he made, to this hand, to these eyes and say, be open, be healed. He doesn't have to do all these things that we may view as conditional, this has to happen and this has to happen in order for this to happen. No. So our faith, maybe, and let me just kind of throw this out there. Our faith, say in ourselves or what have you, or what we've been depending on, again, our faith in our resources may exhaust 
at times and will exhaust, but our faith in God, transfer that faith, that same faith, that same belief, trust, and confidence, transfer it to the word of God, which is inexhaustible. Again, drawing your attention back to Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. Those are three verses. I don't know why I'm stuck on them. Maybe someone needs them. I need them, definitely. Um, Hebrews chapter 13, if you like, you can turn to it. I'll read them. I'll give you the specific ones. He says in verse five, he says, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In verse six, that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. In verse eight, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Again, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Verse 6, that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. Verse 8, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Again, so we talked about relationships, and here in John chapter 5, Really, the emphasis in my mind, these uh, first nine scriptures, uh, the emphasis is there's no limitations in God. There's, there are no limitations in God when it concerns us because he loves us so much, because he cares about us so much. Keep the faith, keep hope alive, keep believing, keep trusting. Doesn't matter how gloom, doesn't matter how, uh, how much despair tries to kick in. Doesn't matter if you're discouraged, hold on to your faith in God. He said in Hebrews chapter 10, cast not away your confidence, cast not away your faith, cast not away your trust in the word of God. I believe God communicates that to us. There are no limitations in Jesus. So as we're seeing this in these early chapters of the gospel of Jesus, according to John, his relationships with these individuals. And now he's saying there's no limitations, this relationship. So establish, maintain, continue to develop your relationship with Christ and in developing it, realize there are no limitations for God in my life. I don't wanna place any limitations on my God, my Jesus, my Lord, my savior in my life. It doesn't matter. If he chooses to heal me, he heals me. And I say that because Jacob had a hollow in his thigh. God never healed him. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, the messenger of Satan that was buffeting, buffeting Paul. The Bible tells us Paul says he prayed three times. It never told us that God took it away. So it's a very, uh, we can, there, we can have a supposition that he died with whatever that was, but God told him this, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is all that you need, but there are no limitations in God. Oftentimes, I believe this, this is just my opinion. I believe through my experience, wherever we are in our lives, God can use us in that capacity. He knows where we are. He knows why we're there. It doesn't limit his usage of us for his glory and for the salvation of souls. Let us pray and then we'll discuss. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for each one in attendance here this evening. Thank you, Lord, that they have carved out time in their busy lives, busy schedules as they wind down the day. Lord, as your servant, I appreciate it. And I pray, God, that you just continue to bless all of us through your word, by your spirit. Help us, Lord. Help us to be the vessels that are fit in the master's hands, in your, in your hands. Use us for your glory and for the salvations of souls. Lord, and as we look into the word of God, help, help us to increase our faith, to develop our faith, as you said, in Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the more we hear your word, we pray the Holy Spirit will continue just to impress upon our hearts faith 
in you, Christ, knowing that there are no limits in you. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. In your wonderful and blessed name, amen and amen.